Today, I want to talk about forgiveness. I don't want to talk about the pandemic. I don't want to talk about the COVID-19 crisis, sheltering in place. I want to talk about the gospel. I want to talk about forgiveness. I think forgiveness is something we all have difficulty grasping the reality of. Have you ever asked for forgiveness of your sins and the next morning you feel you need to ask for them again, for forgiveness again, and the next day again? I would like to suggest it's not more forgiveness you need, it's healing you need, because God says when he forgives our sins, they're forgiven. How forgiven? Well, about 40-some years ago, when I was at Pacific Union College as a student, somewhere between 1975 and 1979, an old retired Seventh-day Adventist pastor by the name of HMS Richard Sr. came and preached at the college church one Sabbath. And believe it or not, over 40 years later, I can remember that sermon in its fullness. Now, I don't remember every illustration he gave, but I remember the four main points. I remember the four main verses. I can't even remember that well what I preached last Sabbath right here. So that's, that's a good sermon if you can remember it 40 years later. HMS Richard Sr. was known as a man who could make the profound simple and rememberable. He actually pioneered the use of radio for the gospel, religious radio programs. He started the Voice of Prophecy, which is the oldest and longest running, continuous running religious broadcast on radio. He decided to use radio to spread the gospel back when a lot of people thought radio was just a tool of the devil. I actually was privileged to meet this gentleman um, a few times before he died in 1985, but he's in his 80s when he preaches this sermon, sharp as ever, and I can still remember it, and I want to share the gist of it with you because it was about how we can grasp the full understanding of just how great God's forgiveness is. He used four verses. I want to use those same four verses. Isaiah 38, 17. God is illustrating four different ways in these four verses how forgiveness actually works and how complete it is. Isaiah 38, 17, indeed, it was for my own peace. Now, the word peace there is shalom, so my own well-being, that I had great bitterness. But you, God, have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Now, this, these are the words of Hezekiah. The Bible says, backing up to verse 1, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord. Now I suppose if you were sick, even if it was with COVID-19, and a real prophet showed up with a thus saith the Lord, you'd be thinking the prophet has come to say, God's going to heal you. But notice what Isaiah says. Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. That is not what you want to hear from a prophet. Isaiah shows up to King Hezekiah, who's sick in bed, and says, put your house in order. This is it. You're going to die. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. Now, just the fact that he turned his face to the wall kind of tells you, at least it sounds to me like he was probably whining and moaning at God, you know. And notice his prayer. He said, Lord, Remember now, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and I have done what is good in your sight. That is a terrible prayer. God did not answer the prayer because of the prayer. I think God answered the prayer because he just felt sorry for this king. Um, I don't know why God was going to let him die at that point, but God evidently... Um, saw Hezekiah weeping bitterly, it says. He turned his face to the wall and he wept bitterly. And he talked to God about how good a guy he was and almost as if to say, God, you owe me one. Well, the Lord never owes us one and we never get the answer to our prayer because we have walked in truth and been loyal or we have done good. We get answers because God is good and merciful. But notice in verse four, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, all right, go tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. How do you like that answer to prayer? 
Would you actually like God to come along and say, okay, I'll heal you. You get 15 more years. Can you imagine the first few years? It feels good. But what are you going to do on the 14th birthday after your healing? You're going to call all your family together and you're going to say, let's have my last birthday. I'm going to die this year. I find some irony in the story, but that's not the point. The point of the story is this. God said, let me, let me get this straight. After Hezekiah was healed, he wrote a poem, a song of thanksgiving to God, a prayer. And you'll find that in verses 10 to 20 of this chapter. And it's his words in verse 17. Indeed, it was for my peace, my shalom, my well-being that I had great bitterness. God can bring good for us even out of bad times. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. What does this say God does with our sins? It says he throws them over his shoulder. He puts them behind his back. He's sitting on his throne and he puts them back there and nobody is going to ask God to move over so they can dredge him up. This is God's way of saying, I leave your sins in my past. You need to leave your sins in your past. We deal in our world today with a lot of addiction. And I know one of the ideas of addiction is that you will spend the rest of your life battling that addiction. You have to go to AA, NA, SA, whatever, the rest of your life in order to keep this addiction under control. I have to tell you, I believe, and I believe the science actually backs it up, that it's possible even for addictions to be left in the rearview mirror. They've done research and discovered that whatever your addiction is, whether it's alcohol or drugs or pornography, whatever it is, there's a section in the very center deep part of your brain that lights up the brain waves just about identical, whatever the addiction is. They've also discovered that it takes three to five years of sobriety for the brain to rewire. So with the help of, of, of someone standing by your side and calling you to accountability with the help of God and the Holy Spirit, sobriety can actually bring a change in the brain waves. These addictions can be left behind. And God says he leaves our sins behind. I'd like to suggest if you ask forgiveness and you're not feeling forgiven, you have been forgiven because God already forgave your sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. If you ask forgiveness, ask once, leave it alone. Now start asking for healing because as we talked about in the past, every time we sin, we damage ourselves. We damage others. We cause brokenness. And when God heals us, we're just a healed. I mean, when God forgives us, we're forgiven, but the brokenness is still there. Now we need healing. But God says, I leave the sins behind so we can move on in life as if those sins never happened. Second illustration comes from Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, the prophet says, pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And then... The prophet speaks directly to God. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now, back in the time of the Bible writers, the sea was the great unknown, kind of like space is to us now. It's something that those who ventured on to the sea, out onto the sea, few came back. Those who went down never came up alive. And the prophet Micah says God's going to put our sins where nobody can go and get them. Nobody goes down and dredges them up. It's kind of fun to think about how deep the sea is. The Mariana Trench, put a map on the screen there. Between Japan and Papua New Guinea, there is a, an arc shape of a deep trench in the Pacific Ocean. And it's the deepest part of the ocean in the whole world. It's about 36,000 feet deep there in the Mariana Trench. If you put Mount Everest in the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the peak of Mount Everest would be 7,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. 
How do we know how deep it is? Well, back in 1875, something called the Challenger Expedition used a weighted rope, if you can believe it. They put a weight on the end of a rope and they let it down and they measured the bottom of the trench at 26,850 feet. That's a long rope. In 1899, the U.S. Nero sounded the depths at 31,614 feet. In 1951, a ship called the Challenger II did an echo sounding of 35,760 feet, thus the name of the Challenger Deep at the very south uh, west end of the Mariana Trench, the very deepest part is called the Challenger Deep, over 30, 35,000 feet. Of course, the Soviets came along six years later and had to beat that. They claimed they sounded it at 36,201 feet. In 1962, the MV Spencer Baird, another ship, did precision soundings with more modern depth gauges, came in at 35,810 feet. The Japanese in 1984 used a special narrow beam echo sounder method and they came at 35,840 feet. And in June of 2009, they used high-tech multi-beam sonar and they came in at 35,994 feet deep in the deepest place, just right on its 36,000. And our sins are evidently down there, at least by illustration. And of course, no one will ever be able to go down and get them, right? Wrong. January 23, 1960, the Bathyscaphe Trieste, with two men in it, went down to 35,814 feet. They went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. They didn't find any of our sins there, by the way. They've sent ROVs, remote-operated vehicles, down several times. In 2012, something called the Deep Sea Challenger with James Cameron, in it, a Canadian film director went down to 35,787 feet. And in April of 2019, a guy named Victor Vescovo in a little uh, thing called the Triton, the Triton, the Triton sub, went down to 35,853 feet, the deepest dive ever. Did he find our sins on the bottom? Well, no, and Yes, you're not going to believe this, but he found a plastic bag and candy wrappers laying on the bottom of the trench down 36,000 feet. So some of our sins have sunk to the bottom. What's the point? It's not really about our sins being at the bottom of the sea. It's God saying to the people in his time, I'm going to put your sins somewhere where nobody can ever go get them. We'd have to use a black hole now. We would say God threw our sins into a black hole because nothing that goes in comes out. God is trying to impress us how fully forgiveness is. Let's go to our third illustration. Psalm 103, verse 12. For as the heavens are high above the earth. How high are the heavens above the earth? How long can you go up? To the best of our knowledge, you can go up for infinity. So great is his mercy toward those who fear him. God has infinite mercy towards us. That's because he's an infinite God. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. I'm glad he used east from west and not north from south because, you know, on a round world, you can go north until you hit the North Pole, and then wherever you're going, wherever you go, you're going south. And you can go south till you hit the South Pole, and no matter where you go from there, you're going north. But you can go east, and you never get west, and you can go west, and you never get east. What God is saying is, I go one direction with you, your sins go the other, and we are going to have an infinite separation between you and your sins. And the fourth illustration, probably my favorite. Isaiah 44, 22, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Have you ever been in the fog? I lived in Central California, Northern California, actually, for some time. And I remember that uh, we were holding meetings over in Chico, California, which is on the east side of the Central Valley of California, north of Sacramento. And one day I needed to drive directly west, almost directly west, over to Williams, a little town right in the center of the Central Valley. 
And I had a motorcycle then, and I'm riding along, and there's this thing in the Central Valley of California called Thule fog. It's a low-lying fog that has caused huge back, uh, huge crash ups on the Interstate 5 because you'll be driving along and the sky is clear and all of a sudden you're in pea soup fog. And I remember I was actually riding home from Williams back to Chico on my motorcycle and I'm riding through this fog and there'd be billows of it and then you'd be out and then you'd be in and then you'd be out and in. And I got in this dense fog and then I looked up as I'm driving really slowly, I glanced up and I could see the sky darkening and the first stars coming out. I thought, now that's funny, I can't see ahead but I can see up. So I stood up on the foot pegs of the motorcycle for just a moment and I discovered my head was above the fog. That fog was right above my eye level and when I stood up, I could see clear across the valley to the mountains, my head was above the fog. Just a little story on Thule fog. For a while I lived in the San Francisco area and here's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge with the fog coming in over the city. I've seen that many, many times. Sometimes the bridge is completely covered with just the tops of those two towers sticking out. It's fascinating to watch. It's also hard to drive through. Now, what happens when the sun comes out strong with heat? What happens to that fog? It slowly begins to dissipate and melt. And when the fog is gone, where did it go? Did it go over the hill? Did it go back out to sea? Did it um, go to the next county? No, when the sun shines on the fog, where does the fog go? It's kind of like saying when you turn the light out, where does the light go? It's gone. And this verse says that God will blot out our transgressions like a thick cloud, like thick fog. When the sun comes out and burns down on that fog, the fog doesn't go somewhere, it goes away. It evaporates. It disappears into thin air, so to speak. So notice now God has given us four illustrations of how complete his forgiveness is. Number one, he puts it behind his back. He leaves it in the past. We can leave it in the past. It's gone. Number two, he puts it in the bottom of the sea. He puts it in a completely inaccessible place where nobody can ever go and get it. He puts it as far from us as the east is from the west, and that is an infinite distance. You'll never meet it again. And he will evaporate it like the fog vanishes into thin air. I think that tells us that when God forgives us, we're forgiven. Those sins are gone. Now I want to add a fifth verse, a fifth illustration to the four that I have given. The four that I've given was the sermon I remember hearing HMS Richards preach. Never forgotten it. But here's a fifth one. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Please notice, he blots them out. That means they're wiped out. And why does he do it? For my own sake, do you catch that, people? He wants to. Sometimes I think we get the feeling that we have to beg God to forgive our sins. We have to roll over, put our face against the wall, and weep bitterly. And if we just feel bad enough, and if we just plead long enough, maybe God will work up enough mercy to give us a little slack. No, this says he wipes out our transgression because he wants to. The next time you've sinned and you've done it again and you come to God and you say, God, I did it again. Could you find it in your heart to forgive me? You need to remember something. God wants to forgive you. He just can't forgive you till you ask because that would be violating your free will. God is just itching to do it. He's just waiting to do it. He's just waiting to take that blotter across your sins and wipe them completely off. He wants to, so why don't we just ask and trust? But that's not all this verse says. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your 
sins. Evidently, God has self-imposed dementia. You know, somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, every, the, the same thing is a brand new experience every day. And it's sad, but it's, sometimes it's kind of funny the way it works out. Everything is new if you have dementia. God claims amnesia. He says, concerning your sins, I won't remember. When God forgives, what that means, and I think we can draw this from all the other illustrations we've used, what that means is that God treats us as if we have never sinned. He says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All. If it's all gone, it's all gone. So believe it or not, if you commit a sin and ask forgiveness, it's forgiven. And if you commit it again and you go to God and you say, I did it again, he says, did what again? Why? Because he forgot. You're the one who remembered. God says, I won't remember. So you never have to go to God and say, I did it again. You can just go to God and say, I did it. Will you please forgive me? And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, let's, I'll forgive you for that. Because he doesn't remember the previous times. You and I remember and think he's not going to have mercy, but we're told he has infinite mercy and infinite forgiveness, and he doesn't remember the past. He treats us so much as if we've never sinned that when we sin again, it's always the first time we've ever sinned. Now, if you steal my lunch and I forgive you, you're a forgiven thief. If you lie to me and I forgive you, you're a forgiven liar. If you murder someone dear to me and I forgive you, you're a forgiven murderer. That's how it works on earth. But God has super forgiveness. When he forgives you, you are no longer a thief, a liar, or a murderer. God looks at you as if you have never sinned. He's forgotten all about it, and he treats you as if this is the first time. And he says, I forgive you for my own sake. I want to forgive you. Now, this concept of forgiveness is what, in theological terms, we call justification. It's when we come to Jesus and when we ask for forgiveness, we pass from death into life, from lost to found. We have that new birth beginning of the new life with Jesus. The moment I enter relationship with Jesus, the old is passed away, and I have new life, eternal life in Jesus. But most of us see justification as forgiveness. I am now a forgiven sinner. God does not see it that way. God has super forgiveness. When he justifies us, when he forgives us, he treats us as if we have never sinned and he never remembers those past sins again. They're gone. Now, you might say I've gone a little bit off the deep end here, but I believe what I presented is biblically sound. But to just nail it down even a little better. You know, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that there was a little lady that lived back in the 1800s who wrote some books, and we believe she was specially inspired by God. We believe that she's not equal as Scripture, but she's head and shoulders above anybody else. And in 1888, our message as Seventh-day Adventists was so focused on obedience that we lost sight of the gospel. And at the General Conference in Minneapolis in 1888, a couple of preachers named Jones and Wagner got up and preached the gospel with new life and new light about understanding not only forgiveness, but super forgiveness, how God completely forgives us and how that forgiveness actually empowers transformation and obedience. And many of the old guard in our church back in the 1880s thought that if you were too secure in Christ, you wouldn't be serious enough about obedience. They kind of believed that insecurity was kept you, is what kept you really trying to be good. But Ellen White, she grabbed onto that message that Jones and Wagner gave in 1888, and she said, this is light from heaven. And you can, if, if you study her writings, there is a shift she is more gospel-centered, more grace-oriented after 1888. And there are four statements that I want to share with you briefly here, which I think are amazing, and they're all from that era. In 1892, 
Ellen White wrote in the book Steps to Christ. It was published in 1892, and this book was published for general consumption, not just for the church. If you give yourselves to him and accept him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God. How? Just as if you had not sinned. The very next April, in the spring of 93, she wrote this in the Signs of the Times, one of our missionary magazines. We are not to serve God in the nature we have that has been redeemed. You know what? I put an ellipsis in the wrong place. Just forget the first part of that statement. I'll have to fix it. What she says in the statement is that we serve God in our sinful fallen bodies, okay? Okay not in some angelic body. Through the righteousness, go with the last four lines now. Through the righteousness of Christ, we shall stand before God pardoned. And how full is that pardon? As though we had never sinned. You're not a pardoned liar. You've never lied. That's how completely God forgives us. August of 1893 in the Adventist Journal Review and Herald, that's the uh, official journal of the church, Satan stands at the head of all the accusers of the brethren. He is the biggest accuser around. But when he presents the sins of the people to God, what does the Lord answer? And then I've left out a whole section here where she talks about Zechariah, or the book of Zechariah, and Joshua the high priest standing in filthy garments before the angel of the Lord. He's condemned. And what does God do? God rebukes Satan, gives Zechariah clean clothes, and he stands in righteousness. And then she concludes, every sin of which they had been guilty was forgiven, and they stood before God as chosen and true, as innocent, as perfect, as though they had never sinned. And finally, in 1895, in the Bible Echo, which was a missionary journal in Australia, she writes, herein is the mystery of redemption, that the innocent, pure, and holy son of the infinite God was permitted to bear the punishment of a thankless race of rebels against the divine government, that through the manifestation of his matchless love, these rebels might be inspired with faith in and the love for God and might stand before him repentant, forgiven, guiltless, as if they had never sinned. I want to assure you today, you are not a forgiven sinner in God's eyes. You're a beloved, perfect child who's never done anything wrong. Now, I've met a few parents who felt that way about their kids. I've had parents come in and say, my child said that their teacher, you know, looked at him cross-eyed. You need to, you need to uh, discipline the teacher. And I have to look at that parent and say, well, isn't it possible that uh, your child did something? Oh, no. Well, I've had to tell a parent a few times, I'm sorry, I have a track record with the teacher that's longer than with your child. I'm not going to throw the teacher out on your child's loan accusation. I've run into these parents. Their child can do no wrong. Well, guess what? That's how God looks at you. That's how God looks at me. He says, I take your sins and I put them behind my back. I leave them in the past. I Put them in the depths of the sea where no one can find them. I put them an infinite distance from you, east from west. I blot them out like the fog dissipates. And beyond that, I don't even remember them. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a sinner, he sees a saint. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a liar, he sees someone filled with truth. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a sexual sinner, he sees a beloved virgin child. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a rebel, he sees a loyal friend. When God looks at you, he doesn't see bad, he sees good. He's put your sins behind his back and moved on. He drowned them in the depths of the sea. He's put them as far as the infinite distance between east and west. He's evaporated them like fog melting into thin air. And he says, I won't even remember them. And when you say, I did it again, he says, did what? And he treats us as though we have never sinned. You and I are super forgiven. We are perfectly forgiven. With that kind of forgiveness, we're not only promised eternal life, but I will guarantee you something. 
if we can begin to understand the fullness and the completeness of God's forgiveness, we will discover that that forgiveness is what brings with it the power to actually make us non-sinners and bring us into obedience and the glorious living of the righteousness God has for us. Super forgiveness. I want to encourage you to look at these verses and think about them. And stop turning your face to the wall and whining to God to please forgive you. He has. Accept it. Move on. And if you sin again, yes, we all will. Don't come to God and ask him if he can forgive you one more time. Because in his eyes, it's your first sin and he wants to forgive you again. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for bearing all our sins and their consequences on the cross. They've been nailed to the cross. They're yours and not ours. And they're not yours by you sitting there mulling over all the things you can see we've done. Because they're yours. You've thrown them out. You've blotted them out. You've drowned them. You've separated them an infinite distance. You've evaporated them. And Lord, we are so good at remembering what you have forgotten. Give us the mind of Christ that we might forget our past as well and move into the glorious future that you have with us where you want to live your life out in us, where we can experience real life, the life of righteousness. Lord, may we stop identifying ourselves by our sin and start identifying ourselves by our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.